Welcome back to today's podcast, Doing Tech Better in Government. I'm Brian Fox, and in this series, you'll be hearing from different technologists and technology leaders in government about their efforts to modernize digital capabilities. Together, we will learn about the technology, the processes, and cultural changes they've adopted to rapidly improve their digital services and hear about their experience leading this change in government. Hello, thank you all for joining us in today's podcast. Um, thanks for joining the Doing Tech Better in Government. Uh, I'm Brian Fox. I work with Omni Federal, and together with ATARC, I host this Doing Tech Better in Government podcast. I'm glad to have Kate Stowe with the Department of Defense joining us today. Kate, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Brian. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your organization, and your role there? You bet. So I am a part of the Defense Innovation Unit. We fall under the Office of Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Uh, we're a very unique organization that was set up by the late Ash Carter to go after commercial technology. He recognized that our industry partners were investing leaps and bounds more into their capabilities and modernization than the department was. And so he wanted to take advantage of that. Also recognized though that our, I don't want to call them archaic, but our archaic acquisition processes were not enabling that and were more of a barrier to entry for many of these non-traditional uh, tech firms. And so when DIU, originally DIUX was stood up, the first thing they went about was and really where I feel like our innovation is, is in our process. Um, we use the OT authority, which many organizations have, to prototype technology and then move into production. But our process is, our CSO process is really tailored and designed for our non-traditional tech companies to lower that barrier of entry for them and, and really welcome them into doing contracting with the federal government. My role in particular is I'm a career Air Force, actually a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, in the reserve, excuse me, and I serve on the cyber portfolio. So DIU is um, separated into six different tech areas, cyber being one of them. And I do defense engagement because the way DIU works is that we are all, again, we're a federal agency sitting under OSD. In our portfolio, we have program managers, uh, we have contracting authority and contracting officers, and we have financial managers. And so what we will do is we will partner with an agency, again, mostly DOD, but we have partnered with other agencies outside the DOD, and we'll partner with that agency and using their problem statement and their funding, we will run that solicitation to get to a prototype, run that project to prototype, and then work with our partner, our DOD partner, to deem the prototype successful or not. And so we kind of are a, a service organization. We are, we're here to help. I will also say, though, that we are one of the, I don't want to call us a best kept secret because I don't want us to be a secret, but uh, we are not very well known, especially in the acquisition communities around. I come from the acquisition community as a program manager. And really prior to this tour with DIU, I was not familiar with DIU at all and really wish I had known about us. So I think my goal in this conversation with you, Brian, is to, to spread the word about DIU um, from both the perspective of how we can help our government partners, but also how we can help our commercial and um, industry partners because that uh, built, bridging that gap um, and getting more cutting edge technology faster and at a better price point in is, I think, you know, all of our goals. So absolutely. And uh, to that, well, are there some specific things that you all are doing, Kate, to help those organizations modernize. You, you talked about OTAs. Um, yeah, anything yeah. else that that you're doing to help them move move forward? Well, so I think the way that DIU contributes to that modernization is by actually bringing in that commercial technology mm -hmm. at a much faster rate. So most DIU projects, contracting, we like to say we're somewhere between sixty and ninety days. 
Um, and then our prototypes last anywhere for 12 months to 18 months, depending on it. You know, there is a level of uh, adopt adaptation that's done for it, the use case. And, but sometimes it's right off the shelf. So in the cyber world, we're handing over new technology sometimes in a matter of months because it's product key or a license that we are enabling the, the customer to get access to. I think one of the unique ways that we're doing that is that many of our industry partners do not have the resources to spend their days scouring SAM.gov, Vulcan, and many of the other tools out there to release Farbase acquisition and, and, and even some of the BAAs and, and the other tools that are out there. Many of them don't have a, an engine, if you will, or a machine to write proposals that are 70, 80 pages long. They just don't have that bandwidth. And so we lose as a government out on the tech from the companies that, that we really want the tech from because we're requiring of them so much effort just to get in the door. So what DIU has done is said, okay, we're going to release a problem statement. It's not a requirements document. It's not a statement of work. It is a problem statement. One page, maybe a page and a half. I've seen a few two-pagers. That gets put out on our website. We also put that out. Um, you can go out to diu.mil and sign up um, to receive our both our solicitations and our newsletter. Um, but those solicitations hit the street for about two weeks. We have an entire team at DIU that comes really from industry for our commercial engagement team. They're out all the time. They're at industry trade shows. They are building connections and relationships with the companies that have the tech that we want. And so they also do their own outreach to say, hey, this is coming down the pipeline. Watch our website. Watch your email. There's going to be a solicitation. So our net that we cast is just so different than, than the one that our traditional government acquisition offices cast. And as a result, we get a lot of companies that you would just never think of that have a solution to our problem or think they do, which is great. So we get a diversity of proposals and of offerings. Um, but that two-page problem statement sits out there for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, a company has to submit, in order to submit a proposal, five pages or less white paper or a 15-slide deck. That's it. That's it. Most companies already have that in their marketing you know, fodder. So the, it's not, we're not asking a lot of them just to tell us what they have and what how they think they could solve that problem. Then a joint team with DIU and our our program managers, and that's something else to know, all of the program managers that sit in DIU are operators, uh, which also makes us unique from multi, from the traditional acquisition office in the government. Um, you know, I'm a traditional program manager. They are operators. So they understand this technology. They understand how to use it. Um, and they're personally invested in making sure that we get the best solutions. So customer, DIU team, they... They sit there for a day or two and they review all of those submissions. They down select to a pool that they invite in to give pitches. Then you do an in-person or virtual pitch. Once those have been completed, the team gets together again. They, you know, pro and con, they do their thing and they, and then they select. And typically DIU likes to select, um, Two, two or three candidates. And if, and if you're not selected and awarded a contract, we can portal you as a viable option for others. We also bring in multiple partners, multiple government partners, which is great too. So we can pull mon monies together to make them go faster. So that I think in my mind, you know, funding is always a challenge in the government. And so if you can find a buddy that's got, you know, 10 bucks and you've got five bucks now together, you've got 15 and you're both going to get a solution out of it versus, you know, both of you sitting around waiting till you have $15. It's just, so it's changing that mindset of working together as organizations for shared outcomes. It's changing the mindset that we don't need 80 pages in a proposal from from a company in order to prove that they're competent. It's, it's, it's those 
those changes that that get better technology in faster, in my opinion. Is there anything you're having to do, Kate, to whether it's on the the folks on the government and, and DOD end of things that are either trying to implement the technology or those folks that are responsible for the acquisition? You mentioned early on how how much you've learned and you had a background in it. And as we know, change can be tough. It's there's usually a lot of emotion around it. I yeah. haven't I haven't implemented that technology. That's that's scary. Or we haven't bought it this way in the past. Right. That seems scary. Is there anything you all are doing to help folks that you're there to serve across DOD feel comfortable about the new tools, technology, the change that way, or the new procurement methods? Sure. So we are in that you can. You know, we will come in and tell you exactly which title U.S. code we're using, why we can use it. We have lawyers in DIU. We have only had one protest in seven years and it wasn't sustained. So our track record speaks for itself. But I hear you because, you know, as a program manager who sat in a program office and executed congressional funding, our system doesn't necessarily lend itself to, hey, let's just go run, you know, Let's just take 10 bucks and go try, you know, reduce some risk and do this because those funds are laid in and reported on a five-year cycle. So one of the things that we've done at DIU is, is more or less just try to educate. Um, we've offered opportunities for um, agencies and teams to kind of flight follow, um, see how we run the process, participate in a project, but not necessarily be the funder or the receiver of the prototype. Um and I feel like that kind of helps people get comfortable with what we're doing. You know, the other thing is, is really trying to change the way we think in the very beginning of acquiring. So, you know, the FAR tells us that in part 10, we have to do market research. That's hard to do. You know, I'm, I'm going to take myself as an example, right? I have a business degree. I've worked in a bunch of different technology areas. Sure. Um, but I, I will never pretend to be an engineer. I will never pretend to be a technologist. And so when I'm responsible for market research and I've got a pretty lean team as it is, and I'm research strapped, my market research probably isn't going to be great. Um, and even if I have a few folks on my team that are, you know, aerospace engineers or, or, um, you know, have a passion in the tech, frankly, they're not, they don't have the bandwidth to spend the time at trade shows and learning about it and things like that. And so our make buy decision, which is that mar what that market research really is there to support is I think at times can be lacking and we tend to err on the side of, well, then let's just make it. If we make it, we can control it. If we make it, we can you know, determine everything. If we have to buy it, is it really going to meet all of our needs and requirements? And we just have a, a culture of just wanting to make it all. <laughs> so it's getting in and saying, hey, listen, in the beginning, when you're sitting there doing that market research and checking that box, hey, call us, call DIU, ask us, is there a commercial market for what we're trying to buy? And, and let us at least provide you that. We may say, no, there's not. And then, and then great, put that in your market research report. But we may say there is. And then that starts the conversation around, could this be a viable, you know, could DIU be a viable tool for that program manager or that team to acquire um, the technology that they're looking for? Um, so, I mean, but let's not, <laughs> let's not fool ourselves. We are, we, when you talked about accepting the, the technology, we are challenged the same as most everybody else right now, that transition, that valley of death. How do we get past a prototype into production? At DIU, we are working on this fast follower strategy, which is, again, really spending time on the acquisition side of the house, doing tech better through the acquisition side, um, because we, we realize that those are the partners that are going they're the ones really responsible for the transition. And so uh, we need a better partner with those organizations. It's wonderful. Um, are, are you able to help both then the technologists and the procurement specialists work together 
to essentially iterate faster, whether it's getting uh, buying quicker in, in smaller bits to just see if things work. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, exactly. Using, using a, a prototypes can do, you know, a couple different things. One, you can prototype something um, commercially used, see if it works in a military environment. If it does, you can go forward with it into a production contract. Like, that's just a, a very fast way to bring something into the government that is a commercial product. But also, you can prototype, to your point, of reducing risk. And, and that's where I look back in many of the programs that I served on, that being able to reduce risk through prototyping was extremely value-added. The problem we still face, though, is that you have to have some forethought if you're a five-year budgeter, that three right. years from now, you may want to do some risk reduction, uh, or, or that three years from now, commercial tech is going to come along and have solved my problems. That's that's just how it works. DIU is having a voice in, in how do we work with our budgeters? How do we understand what comes out in the budget and into the individual PEs? And, and how can we support, maybe not, you know, all of us want to deliver, deliver, deliver. That's not always, so we can say, okay, well, you're going to have funding in a year. We're going to watch the market. We're going to do all that stuff. And in a year when that you have some flexibility in funding, then we'll execute the CSO or the project. Sounds like now are you helping them with the quick prototyping and, and that rapid matchmaking for seeing what's possible, but also helping them be strategically thoughtful. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Numbers. And some yeah. of that. And and again, we're a, we're free. <laughs> uh, we are it, our job is to help others. We are in service to um to to our DOD partners and, and our federal partners um in this fight together. So again, we'll take on that lift of running um a procurement. We'll take on that lift of of uh, dealing with the, the contracting. Um, it's one of the things too, I want to mention on the, on the industry side, mm -hmm. you know, if you do FAR based contracting, um, and there's a time and a place for it and it serves its purpose. Um, but all of your, your clauses are predetermined by the FAR. Um, and so data rights and things like that are, um, it's already predetermined. There, there's no negotiation there for a company. One of the things that OTAs allow us to do is to negotiate our own terms. And so we can negotiate commercial terms with regard to, to IP and data. And I think that's important, especially to some of our very small firms that are just getting on their feet, they're scaling and they're taking off and, the, and they want to they wanna be able to preserve their IP initially. Many companies though that are commercial have no problem sharing APIs and sharing the things that enable us to be interoperable. But it's I think that's to note that we also write our contracts in a way that are industry friendly, if you will, you know? Absolutely. Because they're investing so much in the in the innovation of and creation of those technologies. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Kate, what are We've talked a little bit about successes, and I think I'll, I want to hear more about that. But first, challenges. What are what are some challenges you all face? You mentioned just marketing and advertising, folks within yeah. DOD knowing that you all are there to help. Uh, any other challenges that you all are facing? So I mentioned the valley of death, you know, um, making sure that we have a solid transition partner. We could grade ourselves on transition, um, and that's important to us. And so, but it's still a challenge. The, not just the marketing, but building that kind of trusted agent uh, relationship with our acquisition community so that we're not looked at as people who are trying to come in and be cowboys and do whatever we want. And we'll just, you know, do it better than the acquisition units. It's not the case at all. It is, it is we're an enabler. And so I think getting the right perceptions out there on how DIU can help, we are not a defense works. We are not AF works. We are not a SIBR. We do not deal with SIBR funding at all. And so 
it's some myth busting. In fact, uh, next week I will be talking to an organization and I think the topic is innovation myth busting. And I'm one of the, the speakers there to talk about the fact that when you talk about the defense innovation unit, the innovation is in the process of acquisition, frankly, not, you know, we're, we're taking the tech that's every, you know, that's out there today commercially and bringing it in. So we're not, we're not, spending RDT and E dollars in the early stages. We're looking for stuff that's that's really, you know, TRL nine, eight, nine. It's just that it's being used commercially and we don't know if it's useful in the DOD. So yeah, some perception building, some marketing, building the relationships that are going to enable that successful transition into into production, you know, and just it's it, acquisitions and the engine of acquisitions is a beast. And, and just because somebody does it differently, uh, doesn't mean it's wrong. And so that kind of understanding that, that there are multiple tools in a program manager's toolbox when they're ready to acquire something. Absolutely. That, that is the good work, right? Helping yeah. folks understand that just because they haven't done it before, doesn't mean it's not possible right. and that it's not illegal. <laughs> yeah, it's not illegal. I know. Yeah, we, we would run into those conversations at, at, at 18F too on the acquisition side. So absolutely, yeah. that is a fun part of the job for sure. Yeah. Um, what about some successes? Anything you can point to that, well, we help these folks, we help yeah. those, any successes? So, I mean, DIU sure. has lots of successes in the fact that, I mean, that's the cool part of it is that we're, we are taking problems that are that are in the DOD, we're mar- matching them with great commercial companies and we're delivering very quickly a prototype. I'm trying to think of, there's there's quite a few and, and we're this is a very diverse audience. And so I, I'm trying to think of a few, but for instance, we've delivered 5G pucks that were rapidly prototyped and then purchased and delivered to UCOM um, and in support of, of uh, the issues going on in, in Europe right now, which was really cool. We did that very quickly. They saw a need and they knew there was commercial technology that could solve it. They put two companies on contract and very quickly began to, to adapt that tech uh, for the use for that particular problem. Uh, so that's that was pretty cool. You know, we've done just things like taking industrial manufacturing tools um, and brought them into the DOD Delta supply chain. You know, you think about there. Sure, there are things in the military that are 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 different. We don't deal with weapons. We don't deal with a lot of hypersonics. But hypersonics, another great thing is that, you know, is commercial tech going to build as a hypersonic? No. But right now, the space tourism and space launch and all of that stuff is booming commercially. And so why wouldn't we turn to our commercial partners to come up with test vehicles and to to leverage aspects of of what many would just, you know, simply write off as that's a, a military thing. We don't need commercial tech for it. You know, the UAVs, that that's another big area in which people are quadcopters and all of those things. Um, they're out, that, that's a robust commercial market. And DIU has been able to, to procure a lot of those type of things very quickly for our, war, our warfighter, making sure that Two, we're, we are still bound by all the same rules and regulations that that organiz, you know that any any uh, DoD organization, you know, by American and and all of those kind of things, and we have to do our due diligence. So we do a lot of due diligence on the companies that that we work with to ensure that their parts and their funding and all of that is is on the up and up. So. Yeah, there's so many. I'm just, I think to myself, if you get a chance and you're interested in hearing more about the, how we do things. And in fact, you can go and buy anything that DIU has, has gotten a success memo. So at the end of a prototype, the DIU team and the, the customer come together and if the prototype is deemed successful and that it has 
they have delivered something. It may not have been what they may decide. Yes, they successfully built us a prototype. It doesn't meet our specific needs and failure is okay for us. We're only looking for like a, I think our goal, I should probably know this by heart, but somewhere around like 75, 80, because we recognize failure is okay. Um, and we're prototyping a lot of times to reduce risk. So we ought to be at the edge, at the forward piece of this and, and trying things that, that may fail. Uh, the ability for other government partners to come in and okay, examine so yeah, so thank those you. prototypes that are interesting, but not of use of that particular partner you would so, set them up. With, yeah. Right? So, so like I was saying is that at the end of a prototype, there is a success memo. That success memo is given to the company and then they can use that to let a prototype contract, sole source prototype contract. But yep. also if you are an agency that is interested in just buying something that we've prototyped, if you go to diu.mil, there is okay. a catalog where you can literally search tech. So if you need a cyber tool or you want to look at um, any of the, the human systems uh, tools that we've uh, built or UAVs or radios, or there's just so many of them out there. You can go to that catalog, search your technology. And if there is something there, you, you can, can run with it. Request huh? a success memo and your contracting officer can award a contract, an OTA prototype contract. We're also working on getting many of our companies um, onto GSA, because that's another avenue for the rest of the federal government to, again, two-part goal. One part goal is get non-traditional commercial technology into the hands of our warfighters as fast as possible. Second goal is get the, get business and, and good money to our non-traditional industry partners. So we want to help them scale and we want to help them grow. So if we can get them on a GSA, if we can put them on the catalog so they get more sales, that's all yeah. good because the more sales they have in general means the more they're going to invest in it. And when they invest in their technology, we reap the benefit without having to make that investment ourselves. This is exciting. Okay. Thank <laughs> you so much for being here today. Yeah. Um, thank you. Adrian, uh has been leaning in quite a bit on just innovation and procurement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, don't be surprised if I reach out to you in the future. Uh, related to that working group and maybe yeah. a panel that's coming because I think bringing your perspective uh, uh, would be would be wonderful. But thank you so to. much today. Yeah. Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to say in closing? Nope. Uh, other than diu.mil is a great resource. Um, if you want to reach any of us, there is a you know you can you can hit the button and it'll contact us as a government person. You can contact us as an industry person. And it goes, it goes straight to all like folks like myself and, and, and we take everybody's uh, questions and things like that, if you want to work with us. So thank you so much, Brian, for this opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks for being here. And for uh, everyone in the audience, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Doing Tech Better in Government. Don't hesitate to reach out if you'd like to be a part of a future podcast, as we'd love to hear from you. We hope you enjoyed today's discussion and don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. See you next time doing tech better and double more.